Welcome to our online game change seminar. I am the EC director for astronomy and astrophysics and uh, your host today. And I am especially happy to welcome Dr. Angelo Ricarte, who will uh, give us a talk about seeing the unseeable, imaging the black hole with the Event Horizon uh, Telescope. Uh, before I introduce uh, Angelo, I would like to uh, inform you how this online game changer seminar works, especially then with the questions. So uh, at the end of the seminar, you have three possibilities to ask questions. One is to write directly to the chat. The second one is of one of the other options are to raise your hand or just uh, um, if you raise your hand, then we may uh, unmute your microphone and you can also ask directly the questions. About uh, Angelo Ricard, I would like also to thank the Event Horizon Telescope Communication Office for helping us to find actually Angelo. And I'm very happy to have someone young involved in this activity. So Angelo Ricard is a Filipino-American astrophysicist from California. He completed his undergrad education at the University of California at Berkeley. Afterwards, he completed his PhD in the Yale Astronomy Department with Professor Natara Young. And, um, and he's currently a postdoc fellow at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Physics, as well as the Black Hole Initiative um, member and working with uh, Professor Nara Young. And uh, he's a theoretical astrophysicist working on understanding the formation and evolution of supermassive black holes using computer simulations, both on very close scales of the event horizon and on very large scale on cosmological scales. And he works actively on the event horizon telescope as a worldwide interferometer, uh, which has provided 2019 the first image of a supermassive black hole from um, from M78, uh, 87. So, um, Angelo, the floor or the screen is, uh, is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so, as Maurizio said, I'll be telling you about uh, seeing the unseeable, how we use this technique called very long baseline interferometry uh, to using the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, I'm a theorist, and so I'm interested in understanding how uh, what we see from this image informs our models of how black holes grow and impact their host galaxies uh, over cosmic time. We believe that uh, all massive galaxies host a supermassive black hole at their centers. The best evidence of this originates from the center of our own galaxy, where we can watch individual stellar orbits. That's shown here in this animation on the left, uh, by the Keck UCLA uh, Galactic Center Group. And over the past few decades, uh, we've been able to watch the orbits of individual stars at the center of our galaxy, shown here as these circles. Uh, they appear to be uh, held uh, in this location in, in the gravitational well of a seemingly invisible object, at least in the near infrared uh, here. And by analyzing these orbits, uh, one is able to infer a mass uh, of this invisible object at their center of 4 million times the mass of the sun uh, confined to uh, a scale on the order of about 100 AU. We don't know of anything that could describe this except for a supermassive black hole. Then of course there's M87, which is the main subject of this talk, uh, which has the central black hole, which we call M87 star sometimes, uh, just keeping with the pattern with Sagittarius A star at the center of our galaxy. The Event Horizon Telescope collaboration has imaged this, and uh, we find a mass of six and a half uh, billion times the mass of the sun, uh, three orders of magnitude larger. And using many other dynamical techniques, analyzing stars and gas in aggregate rather than individual orbits that we can only see very nearby, black hole masses have been measured in many other galaxies as well. We find that they correlate with galaxy properties on much larger scales than they're actually able to directly gravitationally influence. And one example of this, these correlations is shown here on the right here, what's called the M-sigma relation, where M is the mass of the supermassive black hole, and sigma is the velocity dispersion of the bulge component of the galaxy, extending kiloparsecs in scale, whereas the gravitational influence of a black hole is typically more like parsecs. You see this uh, 
relationship is rather tight across many decades in uh, black hole mass, where uh, the mass of the black hole roughly goes a sigma to the fourth or fifth power, uh, depending on one's compilation. Uh, now, the black hole at the center of our galaxy is uh, 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 pretty elusive, uh, but others make their presence a lot more obvious. Uh, when a black hole is fueled with a sufficient quantity of gas to accrete, uh, we find that they can shine as an active galactic nucleus or an AGN. And at the center of such systems, we believe uh, something like this is happening. Uh, this black surface here that looks spherical is the event horizon, that point of no return uh, that defines a black hole. And it's being fed by uh, this accretion disk of gas uh, that has been uh, funneled to the center of the galaxy somehow uh, to fuel this uh, black hole like a uh, water spiraling down a drain. Sometimes, but not all of the times, uh, there's often this uh, relativistic jet that is also launched uh, often to very extreme scales. Uh, so what we're seeing here on event horizon scales is uh, typically uh, micro parsecs-ish in size, depends on the mass of the black hole. But these jets can actually extend many, many orders of magnitude much farther in spatial scale. Here's one example, a galaxy called 3C 348, or in the radio Hercules A. You're looking mostly at an optical image where you see this red and dead elliptical galaxy, an old ball of stars. Uh, but in the radio, what's shown in red are these jets that are extending out actually about a million light years in either direction. So black holes, uh, when they're growing, uh, we believe blast uh, powerful jets through their host galaxies, also uh, important radiation and winds. And, uh, and something very small in the center is responsible for this uh, structure on uh, millions of light years in scale. And we believe that uh, in this way, supermassive black holes are important for the cosmic evolution of galaxies. Uh, we think that supermassive black holes, uh, through this process we call AGN feedback, uh, are able to help transform galaxies and regulate their star formation, turning a galaxy like our own, a spiral galaxy that is uh, forming stars efficiently, uh, after moving through uh, an active galactic nucleus phase uh, into more like a red and dead elliptical galaxy shown here on the right. Uh, although the details of this process are still uh, uh, not very well understood and simulators on many uh, scales in terms of uh, both time and, and spatial scales are, are still working very hard to understand this problem. Now I mentioned before that uh, black holes grow when gas is funneled to the center. And uh, this is, is one of the uh, uncertainties in how black holes grow. But one way we think this can happen is through the merger of two galaxies. Here's a simulation back from 2005, uh, where you're looking at uh, two interacting galaxies, two gaseous disks that are merging together. Uh, there are also stars and dark matter, but only the gas is shown here. And it's color coded by temperature, which is cold at the moment. When these uh, two galaxies interact, the uh, nice gas disks get disturbed in the merging interaction. The gas collides with itself, loses angular momentum and starts funneling towards the center, where in this simulation, uh, they've uh, inserted these black hole particles that are allowed to grow and uh, subsequently impart AGN feedback uh, into their surroundings. In this particular simulation, this is uh, in the form of just a direct deposition of energy. And what you can see here when these black holes are starting to grow is that now they are uh, heating up the gas around them and uh, starting to blow it away. Uh, which will reduce the gas content of this galaxy and help uh, transform it into uh, what I called a red and dead elliptical uh, on a previous slide. But like I said, the details of how this work are very poorly understood and simulations like these uh, are only able to reach uh, approximately like parsec scales in today's uh, galaxy scale simulations. Whereas, as I mentioned before, the actual accretion and feedback processes are really happening around maybe microparsecs, depending on the black hole mass. And so this motivates us to have uh, detailed studies of the central engine to really understand these processes. A direct picture or even a movie uh, would be very helpful here. Physicist James Bardeen is quoted as saying, uh, back in 1973, it is conceptually interesting, if not astrophysically very important, 
to calculate the precise apparent shape of the black hole. Unfortunately, there seems to be no hope of observing this effect. Uh, fortunately, as, as you know, um, I, both of these sentences uh, appear to be wrong. Uh, we've already now imaged the black hole and uh, have, have learned a lot about the physics and uh, hope to learn a lot more, as I'll, I'll tell you about later in this talk. Actually, only a few years after uh, this quote, uh, the first uh, computational uh, calculation of what a black hole ought to look like was completed by Lumine, published in uh, 1979, which is uh, uh, given, uh, given the year here. You can see uh, some interesting features that I'll, I'll point out later, which uh, include the fact that uh, there's this really narrow ring inside, and then uh, this part is brighter than, than the other side, uh, which will be important for uh, understanding the black hole image that we'll be talking about. Now, this was using a simple calculation based on a thin disk. Nowadays, in order to do it uh, in the most more sophisticated manner, uh, the state of the art is to start out with a simulation that looks like this, uh, zoomed in on the central engine uh, of these active galactic nuclei. This simulation is called a general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulation, or GRMHD, and uh, is some of the most uh, impressive physical simulations uh, uh, that I'm aware of. Here you evolve the uh, plasma as it's uh, moving in a space-time uh, defined by a Kerr black hole of some spin taking into account all general relativistic effects. What you're seeing here is, is mostly the gas, uh, where the disk gas is in orange, and uh, the jet is, is kind of outlined here in white. And the ribbons you see here are the magnetic field lines. Many of them are uh, kind of tangled inside of the disk. Uh, others are um, twisting inside of the jet and actually anchored onto the black hole itself. One of the things we'd like to really understand better is uh, the strength and structure of the magnetic field uh, as inferred from our black hole images, as I'll get to. Uh, now, to get a simulated image from a simulation like this, uh, it's actually not straightforward to uh, just uh, take the simulation output and maybe scale it by density or something. One needs to take into account uh, where the emission is happening and uh, how a radiative transfer uh, actually proceeds in the presence of a black hole in these magnetized plasmas. Uh, what's, what's needed next is a subsequent calculation using this as its starting point called general relativistic radiative transfer or ray tracing, either way, uh, GRRT. This happens to be my personal specialty within the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. And there are some interesting dissimilarities between this and the video that you saw before. So first of all, it's asymmetric. Uh, the left side is brighter than the other side. This is due to Doppler beaming, or the relativistic Doppler effect. Uh, that is, uh, when since this plasma is moving near the speed of light, uh, the emission gets focused in the direction of motion. And so the fact that the left side is brighter than the right side tells us that the plasma is uh, rotating in such a way that it's moving towards us on the left and away from us on the right. Then we've got this uh, eerily still and almost perfectly circular ring. This is what we call the photon ring. It's uh, made of light that's actually made some orbits around the black hole. There's a region uh, that in short shield is this photon sphere at three gravitational radii uh, that actually corresponds to an unstable orbit of fo for photons uh, around the black hole. Uh, they can ar orbit an arbitrary, an arbitrary number of times before eventually either plunging into the event horizon or getting flung out to infinity. And um, when they're flung out to infinity, uh, what we observe here is actually a, a very still and uh, well-defined ring predicted by general relativity. Finally, uh, there's this dark part in the middle. This is what we call the black hole shadow. And that's the direct image of the event horizon. Uh, that is any light rays that we would shoot from us uh, into that part of the image would plunge directly into the black hole. When doing these calculations, you need to take into account that uh, light is traveling not in straight lines, uh, but in complicated paths. In practice, what we first do is solve the geodesic equation uh, for photons in the space-time uh, for, for those which will eventually reach our image. 
and then solve the radiative transfer equation along that geodesic. Some of the light uh, takes only slightly bent paths. This is what we call the direct image or the n equals zero image where n is counting the number of half orbits that a photon makes around a black hole. And this looks more or less like uh, the accretion flow itself. But then, like I mentioned, there are those which uh, can orbit around the black hole some number of times. N equals one has made one U-turn. And uh, this, as you'll see, gets uh, fo focused into this photon ring uh, which is a lot narrower, narrower than uh, the n equals uh, zero image. In fact, uh, what we see is actually an infinite series of fainter and fainter, narrower and narrower rings all stacked on top of each other. And uh, here we've, we're looking at ones that have made a full loop-de-loop -loop around the black hole. The total image um, that is predicted from theory, uh, if we had perfect resolution, would look something like this. Uh, for this particular model. You may be more familiar uh, with this one, which is from the movie Interstellar, uh, also featured in my, in my Zoom background here. And uh, you'll see that uh, uh, they actually did some serious science. And you can even see this photon ring here, this narrow ring. Uh, but if you've been paying attention so far, you'll, you'll notice that uh, they didn't include the Doppler beaming uh, because that was deemed uh, uh, too confusing for the audience at this time. Uh, now, what is it that we want to learn from uh, making these images of black holes? As I mentioned, there's a lot we don't fully understand about uh, plasma accretion and feedback on these scales. One of the most uh, pressing questions for those of us interested in the evolution of galaxies is uh, how do black holes launch jets? Uh, and uh, what is the what are the energetics in terms of how the black hole transforms an, its accretion rate into a jet power, which uh, will then uh, influence the energy budget of the galaxy. Next, we'd also like to know what is the nature of the magnetic field? Uh, this is a visualization that I made of two simulations where in each of these panels from left to right, you're looking at a different component of the azimuthally average magnetic field and Kerr shield coordinates. Um, first radially, uh, azimuthally, and then vertically. Um, but the point is that uh, the top looks a lot more stable and ordered than the bottom, which is uh, more frothy and turbulent. These correspond to two different categories, which are my favorite acronyms in all of astronomy. We've got a magnetically arrested disk, or a MAD, and standard and normal evolution, or a SANE, uh, on the bottom. So uh, determining the relative insanity of uh, these accretion flows has been one of the main uh, drivers of this project. We'd also like to know how fast black holes spin. Uh, that is, what is the angular momentum of these black holes? And uh, this is influenced by its cosmic evolution. For example, a black hole that has recently undergone an, an equal mass merger with another one will end up uh, typically with uh, a pretty substantial spin uh, compared to one which has been uh, growing from gas accretion at random orientations over the past uh, several billion years. And so this could help uh, inform uh, how black holes have assembled. And then finally, many of us are interested in just testing, is general relativity correct? Uh, GR has, has passed all the tests we've been able to throw at it for the past 100 years, uh, but this offers us an a unique opportunity to test it in the strong gravity regime. And so one thing we'd like to do, for example, is to um, make sure that we can see this photon ring signature, which is a prediction from general relativity. So suppose you want to take an image of the shadow of a black hole. Uh, every astronomer knows this basic equation where the resolution element of your observation is uh, going to be proportional to the observing wavelength that you're using and inversely proportional to the size of your telescope. The masses and distances of nearby uh, supermassive black holes uh, set the left-hand side of this equation. It turns out we actually need enough resolution to be able to see a golf ball on the moon, actually three orders of magnitude better resolution than the Hubble Space Telescope. That may sound disheartening, uh, but let's take a look at the other parts of the equation to see if there's anything else we can do here. So first, uh, the observing wavelength. Astronomers take full use of the entire electromagnetic spectrum from high energy gamma and X-rays to gently sloping radio waves. 
especially when it comes to black holes, which uh, tend to emit radiation everywhere if they've got uh, um, gas to accrete from. Uh, now, in this simulation here uh, by C.K. Chan, what you're going to see is uh, what the simulated image of a black hole looks like, again, with perfect resolution, spatial resolution, uh, as we move to higher and higher frequencies, starting here at uh, 10 to the 10 hertz and then uh, moving higher. So, so far, uh, the image of the event horizon is obscured. At this wavelength, the, uh, the accretion flow is optically thick. There is still interesting stuff here. It's, it, would be, it is interesting to know about uh, the accretion flow and jet on these scales. Uh, but say we want to get down to the event horizon and photon ring itself. It's only at about one millimeter uh, where you can start to uh, be able to, to see the shadow very clearly. And it turns out by a nice cosmic coincidence uh, that uh, that happens to be near the peak of emission for synchrotron radiation which is the radiation that we're seeing. And it also uh, happens to be at a point where uh, uh, the atmosphere itself is relatively transparent. So let's put in uh, for the observing wavelength one millimeter here. Uh, now, we, one can obviously rearrange and then uh, determine the size of the telescope you need. Hopefully, it's not too expensive. Yeah, so um, given these constraints, one needs to have the resolution equivalent to a telescope equal to the di diameter of the Earth. Unfortunately, that's probably really expensive, might have uh, uh, bad environmental consequences if we turned the entire Earth into a single dish. Uh, but fortunately, uh, especially in the radio, uh, there is a cheat that we can use in order to achieve this kind of resolution without having to turn the entire Earth into a telescope. And that's interferometry. Uh, in this technique, uh, two separate dishes observe an object simultaneously at, and uh, their signals are correlated in a computer um, at the same time. And when you do this, your resolution element is no longer set by the size of your telescope, uh, but rather the separation between them, allowing one to achieve high resolution, uh, especially in the radio, uh, where uh, without having to have always enormous dishes. This is one of the uh, premier interferometers in the world, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, or ALMA. You can see there are tens of telescopes here uh, that uh, can operate as one and uh, are able to take advantage of the separations rather than filling in this entire area uh, all with uh, a giant telescope dish. Uh, this brings us now to uh, the technique that we use for the event horizon telescope. What we saw before was still not a telescope the size of the Earth. Uh, what one needs to do is uh, use many telescopes all around the globe and try and uh, implement this technique by having them all observed simultaneously. This is called very long baseline interferometry, or VLBI, science on a truly global scale. And uh, what you're seeing here are the actual stations used in uh, the 2017 observations uh, that created the historic image for the black hole in the, in the center of the M87 galaxy. Uh, there are six different stations uh, represented here. Uh, you may notice that uh, one of them is ALMA itself. Uh, so even though uh, ALMA is comprised of uh, many separate telescopes, uh, it, it's treated as an individual station as part of an even larger interferometer uh, in this case. Uh, here's a, a walk through the different sites used in that observation from the South Pole to Spain to Chile, uh, Mexico, and uh, several in the United States, uh, Arizona and Hawaii. And uh, more sites are being continued, are, are, are uh, continually added to this array in hopes of making even better images. Uh, after taking this data using VLBI, uh, it's actually so much data, you can't efficiently transport it over the internet. Instead, uh, it's a lot faster to physically ship uh, hard drives containing the information that was taken from these telescopes uh, to do this correlation in supercomputing clusters later. This is scientist Katie Bowman uh, posing with a subset of the uh, hard drives that uh, 
were used for uh, the Event Horizon Telescope observations. For M87 alone, I know that uh, the, the raw data for that image uh, consisted of uh, half of a petabyte of data that needed to be shipped all to the same location. It should be pretty obvious from uh, the rotating globe from before, uh, but none of this would be possible without international collaboration and, and cooperation. The Event Horizon Telescope collaboration right now uh, has about 300 members uh, from 66 institutions and 21 different countries uh, from last that uh, we, were, we were able to um, get those numbers together. And uh, I consider myself lucky living here on the East Coast of the United States uh, where, uh, whoops, uh, where I can be joined uh, uh, during the telecons from people spanning all the way from Europe to uh, uh, East Asia. Uh, all trying to meet and collaborate, working on the same problems. Sorry about that. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, uh, how interferometry works, uh, because it's not like putting together a mosaic or a puzzle. I think a common misconception is that uh, maybe one telescope is looking at the top and another is looking at the bottom and another is looking at some side. Uh, but this is not what's happening. And uh, what's going on is uh, something much more complicated and uh, pretty beautiful, actually. Interferometric image reconstruction is actually more like trying to put together a song when you only have some of the notes, uh, where you have uh, only, say, individual uh, notes on a keyboard accessible to you. Uh, this is a movie uh, made by uh, scientist Katie Bowman, actually the one who posed next to a bunch of hard drives earlier. And uh, in this video, uh, more and more notes are going to be added. See if uh, your brain can reconstruct this song uh, as uh, you obtain more and more information. So with only a couple notes, you can't really tell what the song is. Uh, but even with uh, maybe 10 of them, if you know what to expect anyway, uh, your brain can fill in the missing information. And uh, that's basically what we're doing with uh, Event Horizon Telescope Imaging and uh, very long baseline interferometry uh, in general. Uh, in this analogy, each pair of telescopes gives you one key on the piano. A uh, pair is what we call a baseline. And which one that you get depends on their separation and angle uh, with respect to the image on the sky. Instead of notes on a song, what we observe are spatial frequencies of the image. And since an image is a uh, 2D signal in space instead of a 1D signal in time, it's more like we have a 2D grid of pianos uh, where we're getting uh, individual notes. Uh, to be a bit more technical, uh, we observe within a ferrometry, actually the direct Fourier transform of the image and sample that in different uh, uh, locations in Fourier space, depending on the separation and, uh, and angle of the, uh, of the baselines. So given only these two uh, points so far, uh, this is our best guess of the image based on the spatial frequencies that are included, which just looks like a blob and uh, with only uh, one baseline like this, uh, all you have is uh, a rough idea of the size on some scale uh, only in one direction, it turns out. Uh, but uh, interferometry takes advantage of the fact that as the Earth rotates, more and more telescopes swivel into view and the orientation of these baselines changes, allowing you to sample Fourier space uh, uh, more completely, although it's still uh, quite sparse sampling uh, in this case. Eventually, uh, when all of the points are included, you can see uh, that uh, this enables the reconstruction of the historic ring image of the black hole at the center of M87. 
let's zoom in onto this galaxy to put into perspective uh, how impressive this resolution is. So here's uh, the M87 galaxy. It's another one of these uh, red and dead ellipticals. Uh, it's a very massive galaxy. Uh, this is the central cluster galaxy of a galaxy cluster, uh, the Virgo cluster, uh, which is uh, one of the uh, most massive uh, structures that can exist at, at this point in, in history, in cosmic history. And uh, as we move uh, inward, we're moving through different telescopes. Already, we've made it to the Hubble Space Telescope in visible light, where you can see this jet that is emanating from the center, although perhaps not as impressive as, the, as Hercules A, which spans uh, millions of light years. And as we go deeper and deeper towards the core, the only techniques that can achieve this kind of resolution are going to be interferometric techniques. And here we're at uh, the very long baseline array. You can also get different levels of resolution by looking at different frequencies and also uh, different configurations of, of your interferometer. And finally, at the very center, we arrive here at the Event Horizon Telescope image. Here it is uh, soon compared to the size of the solar system. And we've got something about six and a half billion times the mass of the sun, where typically, uh, only one star uh, would occupy the space. Uh, here's another look at this telescope, at this uh, image. One thing that you can do uh, when you uh, take an image like this is actually make a direct measurement of the mass. That's because the size of this ring, the size of the shadow or the photon ring is directly proportional to the black hole mass. And as I've mentioned already before a couple of times, uh, we find a mass of six and a half billion times the mass of the sun. This had been estimated before using the dynamics in, of stars and gas and aggregate on larger scales. Uh, it turns out there was actually a disagreement between those two measurements by a factor of two. So it was good to know that uh, um, it turns out that this mass measurement was consistent with the stellar dynamical measurement instead of the gas dynamics one. The asymmetry of this image, the fact that the bottom is is uh, brighter than the top. Also gives us some insight into the direction that the black hole is spinning. So we've got uh, this jet that we've seen on larger scales as well. Um, and we believe that the black hole, uh, that, that the accretion flow on very small scales is uh, following the rotation axis of the black hole spin. Uh, in this case, um, just uh, making some inferences about uh, the overall geometry of this. This means that uh, we prefer black holes with angular momentum vectors that are actually pointed away from us. Uh, here's another view of the uh, black hole to scale with our solar system. And to put in perspective that enormous mass, uh, this is the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's a dwarf galaxy, uh, one of the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way actually. And this has an estimated stellar mass of 2.7 uh, billion times the mass of the sun. This black hole in this galaxy has about uh, two and a half times that amount of mass, uh, enough for an entire dwarf galaxy of stars uh, crammed into uh, this space where you would typically, again, only see one star in the solar system. What you're looking at is very hot plasma swirling around near the speed of light. The black part in the, sh in the middle is kind of like a, a silhouette and uh, what we call the shadow. The only reason we can see it is because there's something else around it that is emitting. This is extremely hot plasma uh, with an electron temperature of, uh, we think about 10 to the 10 Kelvin. Uh, for comparison, even the center of the sun is around 10 to the seven Kelvin. And so this is uh, many orders of magnitude hotter than that. Earlier this year, uh, we incorporated uh, now linear polarization into the image, uh, which uh, upgrades it into this. This new image offers insights into the strength and geometry of the magnetic field. And uh, what we've attempted to visualize here is uh, the linear polarization, that is the di uh, oscillation direction of the electric field as it's uh, hitting us here on Earth. Uh, we don't actually spatially resolve like individual streams uh, on on this uh, accretion flow, uh, but that's rather just uh, uh, telling us which way the linear polarization 
is oriented in a particular region. And the reason this offers us uh, new insights into the magnetic field uh, is because what we're observing in the millimeter is synchrotron radiation. And this has a large intrinsic linear polarization fraction of uh, around 70%. Now at emission, the polarization ticks uh, just get oriented perpendicular to the local magnetic field. This gets modified by um, parallel transport as you're moving in this warped space time, as well as uh, something called Faraday rotation. Um, but uh, at least uh, at the beginning, there's this uh, direct relationship between uh, how the polarization is oriented versus what the magnetic field geometry looks like. In this uh, recent paper by Palumbo, Wang, and Prather 2020, uh, they showed that uh, this, these MAD simulations, the one with the strong stable magnetic field, actually exhibited a more twisty polarization pattern than the same, as you can see here from one of their figures. It's more clearly shown in the blurred image to roughly uh, EHT resolution. You can see this pinwheel pattern uh, for the MAD and a radial pattern for the same. Uh, to, to better understand this, uh, we have an animation for this as well. Again, we've got uh, an accretion disk uh, with a black hole uh, around a black hole, and we're going to follow the photons as they go to the camera. This time we've got magnetic fields uh, visualized in purple. If the magnetic fields are relatively weak, uh, that is if we're in the same case, uh, the uh, magnetic fields tend to uh, just go with the flow with the rotation and get sheared out into this toroidal configuration. Then because the uh, polarization is 90 degrees with respect to that, we end up with this radial pattern for the polarization ticks. On the other hand, in these MAD simulations, we often see that the radial component of the magnetic field in the midplane becomes more relevant. And in a purely radial case, uh, you would expect that uh, all of the linear polarization ticks would there, therefore be uh, uh, concentric circles. Now to get something that looks more like the EHT image, you need some parts toroidal, some parts radial field. Um, and uh, you'll end up with the spiraling pattern with an opposite handedness compared to what we started with. Uh, now, this is uh, to remind you a simplistic information, ignoring uh, general relativistic effects, also the vertical component of the magnetic field, which we believe is, is important, as well as Faraday rotation. Um, but that should give you a general intuition into uh, how we're able to make inferences about the magnetic field. To do this properly, what we did was uh, do the full uh, GRMHD plus GRRT simulation pipeline to make a whole bunch of simulation, simulated images to compare. And this is what you'll find in uh, the theory paper from this year. Uh, now, from the observed data, uh, we decided on a few different uh, important metrics that we wanted to match from, uh, from these observations. There's uh, the net linear, po uh, linear polarization fraction. There's also an upper limit on the circular polarization fraction, which I'll get to later as well. Uh, the image average spatially resolved linear polarization fraction, which is, uh, which is higher. And then a metric that's uh, attempting to capture the twistiness of the linear polarization. That is the fact that uh, you've got lines that are wrapping around in a spiral pattern like this, rather than going the other way or uh, rather than looking radial or purely toroidal. On the theory side, we ended up making 72,000 simulated images. Uh, these sampled both of the uh, different magnetic field states that we would like to distinguish, uh, five different black hole spins, and uh, 12 different electron temperature prescriptions as well. It's actually uh, uncertain how the uh, um, plasma is heated in detail in these simulations and uh, needs to be prescribed uh, separately. And so after doing this, and uh, uh, considering only the models which pass these constraints, uh, we now think that M87's black hole is one of these MADs instead of one of the SANES. You can see here some information that we can pass on to people who are doing these simulations on larger cosmological or galaxy scales that are important, namely things uh, like its accretion rate, what we call M dot, and the jet power, uh, which is important for uh, uh, heating up gas and, on larger scales. Uh, using total intensity constraints alone, what you see is this blue histogram. And uh, in red is what happens when you uh, use the polarimetry constraints, uh, which are much more constraining, especially in ruling out these uh, SANE models. 
other things that uh, are interesting to pass on to uh, galaxy scale folks so that the accretion rate is a lot less than one would expect from spherically symmetric inflow, what we call Bondi accretion, um, which is uh, unfortunately what is often assumed in most galaxy scale simulations. Radiative efficiencies of these disks are all really low, which is what we expect in this uh, low accretion rate regime um, compared to the black hole's mass. And the jet powers actually happen to be small compared to the larger scale requirements. Maybe that just means that uh, we happen to catch M87 at a quiet time relative to how uh, powerful its jet was a million years ago. So, so far we've learned that M87 star has a confirmed mass of six and a half billion solar masses. Its rotation axis is pointed away from us. And we think it also has magnetic fields strong enough to affect gas motion. Uh, no problems with general relativity so far as well. Uh, but there's still a lot we want to know, and our, st our story is uh, very far from done. Uh, is Sagittarius a star any different? How is the plasma heated in detail? Can we uh, one day resolve the photon ring, that signature predicted by general relativity? How fast are these black holes spinning? And are our results going to hold up uh, as these sources uh, continue to e evolve in time? So now I'm going to pivot towards uh, some future prospects and uh, theoretical predictions that uh, we hope to validate with EHT in the future. One that I mentioned before is circular polarization. So light doesn't only have to oscillate in a plane. Uh, in general, it's elliptically polarized. And uh, the intrinsic emission mechanism in these models, uh, synchrotron radiation, has a small intrinsic circular polarization fraction of around 1% a lot less than the linear polarization fraction. And you can also generate it by a process called Faraday conversion, which exchanges uh, linear and circular polarization states. Uh, what you're looking at on the right is a simulation that I did of uh, what a circularly polarized image might look like with perfect resolution. Uh, and uh, uh, the colors are encoding whether the a circular polarization is clockwise versus counterclockwise as it's intercepting us. Uh, one interesting thing to note is that uh, we, we find both in uh, a typical circularly polarized image. And it's possible that it may emphasize the photon ring in some ways, uh, which will be uh, interesting to keep in mind as we continue analyzing our sources. Now that we've seen the black hole on event horizon scales, uh, it'll be interesting to probe the different regions of the plasma with different frequencies. So you, you may remember from uh, many slides ago, uh, that animation on the left showing that different frequencies allow you to probe different regions due to the optical depth evolving. You can also make a map of uh, the change in the intensity for a small step in frequency, uh, what one would call a, resol a spatially resolved spectral index map. This is something that I've been looking into personally as well. Um, over this past year. And we find that generically, uh, the spectral index ought to uh, be more positive in the center, more negative in the outskirts. Um, that is that uh, the image ought to be fading more uh, on the outskirts, whereas something like the photon ring ought to be more stable. Uh, again, an interesting signature for, for us to look for, and one that probes in another way, density, temperature, and magnetic fields in this underlying plasma. Our most common question is probably what's going on with Sagittarius A star. And we're very interested to, uh, um, to analyze this data because Sagittarius A star is different. Uh, it lives in a very different kind of galaxy. We live in a spiral rather than an elliptical. It's a thousand times less massive and it doesn't have a jet, meaning that its secretion flow could uh, in principle be quite different from what we saw with M87. Sagittarius A star actually appears larger on the sky than M87, and the data have already been taken. Um, but uh, it's a difficult process to uh, analyze uh, these data. And uh, one of the biggest challenges with Sagittarius A star is that because it's a thousand times less massive, uh, its typical time scale for variability is a thousand times faster, uh, which uh, can break the assumption uh, often used in interferometry that uh, your source is not evolving uh, as you let the Earth rotate and sample the Fourier transform. Um, uh, instead, the Fourier transform itself could be significantly changing. Finally, uh, one straightforward thing that we can get uh, as we just keep taking more data is a handle on the time variability. In the simulations, the images move around quite a lot. 
There's already evidence of wobbling uh, of the M87 image over the past decade from Vilgus et al. 2020. This is using proto EHT data uh, where uh, the sampling is not good enough to uh, actually make an image, but you can still get an idea of the relative orientation of which part is brighter uh, than the other. It'll be a lot more clear if we can actually make these images and make movies in the future. So just stay tuned as we record and continue to analyze more data. And then on longer timescales, uh, we're hoping to develop the next generation Event Horizon Telescope or the NGEHT. Uh, in this figure here from Raymond et al. 2021, uh, existing EHT sites are marked in blue. Uh, you can see there's been uh, some development since the 2017 uh, observations. And then some candidate sites are shown in red distributed all around the globe. In addition to adding more of these uh, sites, we hope to have more bandwidth, which will allow for just increased signal to noise because you're just literally recording more data, uh, as well as uh, frequency studies. More uh, frequencies uh, uh, at dis discrete steps, uh, like complementary images at perhaps 86, 345, and 690 gigahertz. And uh, these additional stations will enable us to have a much better dynamic range in intensity. We believe that uh, some configurations of the NGEHT will enable us to have not just a, a single blurry image of the event horizon scale accretion flow, but rather something like this. This is a simulation uh, by Andrew Chale, and then that uh, image reconstruction was done with a uh, particular configuration of the NGEHT by Lindy Blackburn. And you can see that uh, we hope to have movies of the accretion flow and uh, the jet of M87 not only at uh, the event horizon, but also on larger scales. What really helps here is uh, just uh, adding more telescopes uh, to fill in our, our coverage of the of Fourier space uh, on the Earth. There's all, there are also some thoughts about uh, adding some stations in space. Uh, this is uh, just at the ideas stage at the moment, uh, trying to figure out what might be a, uh, a useful kind of experiment to build. And this is uh, showing that uh, if you add one satellite in low Earth orbit, you can fill in the virtual dish uh, of, the, of the EHT that is uh, obtain a lot more points in Fourier space much more rapidly than if you're waiting for the Earth to rotate. This is uh, very advantageous if you're worried about the variability of Sag A star at the center of the galaxy, for example, um, which could allow you to uh, take uh, snapshot movies with a um, much higher time resolution than if you're waiting for the Earth to rotate. In addition, uh, if you go out into space, well, this is one of the only ways that you can actually get a higher resolution image uh, by increasing the spacing between your telescopes, lengthening the baselines. Uh, this is one particular way that uh, has been proposed well by uh, uh, this paper by Frank Roloffs. And here there are there's a trio of satellites uh, at a substan substantial different uh, distance from the Earth that are orbiting uh, at uh, slightly different uh, um, locations. You can see that you fill in the uh, plane in, in Fourier space with this spiraling pattern. And this would allow you to achieve a higher spatial resolution. So in conclusion, uh, we use this technique called very long baseline interferometry in order to image uh, these black holes. And uh, we've so far imaged the black hole at the center of the galaxy M87. We compare EHT images with tens of thousands of models from general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics uh, plus subsequent ray tracing. And we find that the data favor magnetically arrested disks, which have uh, dynamically important magnetic fields. There's going to be a lot more to learn from Sagittarius A star time variability, multi-frequency studies, improved dynamic range, and improved spatial resolution in the future. So I hope I've uh, uh, told you some things that you can take home about black holes, um, what scientists can do when uh, uh, working together uh, across the globe, and uh, have uh, shown that our story is uh, very much not done. So thank you, and uh, I will take questions. So thank you very much, Angelo, the beautiful 
beautiful talk. Sorry, let's see if I can put on my camera. Yeah, very clear and beautiful talks talk and I'm um, very happy actually that you were, thank you that you were giving this talk to, uh, to us. There are already some, uh, some questions and um, one is from uh, Mark Sargent. So Mark, please ask your question. Hi, Angelo, can you hear me? Yes. Good, thanks as well from my side for your talk. I was just wondering about two things. Uh, on the one hand, I don't know if you mentioned this, but what is the, the fractional intensity of the polarized emission? So with respect to the unpolarized emission. And my second question is, um, if the observations you've done with the Event Horizon Telescope have led to any new or modified uh, insight as to how the black hole is potentially moving with respect to the overall system of M87? So is there any okay. relative motion or is it basically at rest in the center? Um, so that's not something that we can determine. We don't have a relative astrometry for uh, M87 and we always just uh, center our images when doing the imagery construction. Um, now, to answer your first question, uh, there's this table here that you can also find in uh, the first polarization, actually both of the polarization papers. Uh, there are two values for the, um, for the linear polarization fraction. The one that I call net is uh, if you don't spatially resolve anything, um, and uh, that's at the few percent level. And uh, the one that's called average is uh, when you do have uh, spatial resolution and using the reconstructed image, uh, do an intensity weighted average of the uh, linear polarization fraction across the image, which has a higher value. Uh, this is still a lot smaller than uh, what I said was intrinsic to synchrotron, uh, which is uh, roughly 70%. Uh, part of, the, part of the, this has to do with the fact that the magnetic field is oriented uh, differently uh, at different locations. And so if a magnetic field is this way in one part of the disk and this way in another part of the disk, the polarization can cancel. Um, but more importantly, we believe that uh, actually Faraday rotation uh, is very important for depolarizing our images. And we've shown that uh, in, the, in the theory side. That is, there's a lot of, uh, there's a substantial population of cold electrons that uh, are rotating these polarization ticks along the line of sight. And uh, if you rotate them enough, uh, they will average down to a smaller value and also cancel with their neighbors what's called both bandwidth depolarization and uh, beam depolarization. So we have one more question from William, William Wall. Hello, um, am I coming through? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I, I just, I just loved your talk. Um, yeah, I wanted to say that your, um, your way of explaining aperture synthesis was very noteworthy pun intended. Um, I, uh, my, <laughs> my, my question uh, is, is about this, this um, mad and sane um, limits of uh, describing your, your jet uh, coming from the, from the accretion disk. Um, you've measured sort of the level of madness using the, uh, using the, the uh, observations of M87's black hole. Does, does this tell you something about how the jet is collimated, this, this relative uh, uh, contributions between mad and sane? Uh, this is something that we still need to study in more detail. Uh, so we've, we've really been focusing on event horizon scale structure. Uh, these GRMHD simulations uh, also extend out to jet scales. And we do notice that uh, there are, they do, the jets themselves do appear different. They have different opening angles, uh, for example, as a function of spin and uh, tend to uh, yeah, be narrower for sanes as well um, and uh, have uh, just uh, weaker powers for sanes for a given amount of accretion rate. Um, uh, I think the, in, in detail, the, the answer to your question is not really uh, understood yet. We've still got a lot of studies to, to do and uh, comparisons with different codes as well. Um, but in principle, uh, there, there ought to be information there. Um, uh, in addition, uh, there's, there's probably going to be uh, uh, constraints uh, from polarimetry, uh, spatially resolved on jet scales as well, has not been uh, fully taken into account. All right, thank you. 
And now we have one question in the chat and still one raised hand from Lou. So the question in the chat is from Mike Heraclius. Given the necessary exposure time needed to make an image snapshot with reasonable signal to noise, there must be a minimum time scale that can be resolved. Now, with this in mind, how close can we get to the event horizon of M87 and still resolve the dynamical uh, time? It's How written. close can we? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. The so the dynamical, uh, the the structure of uh, of the M eighty seven accretion flow is uh, uh, it's moving on a time scale of days. So we're okay. Um, you can see some hints of time evolution in the uh, twenty nineteen paper already. Um, although this has not been, we haven't made any strong statements about this because the image reconstruction is always uh, uh, uncertain. Um, for Sagittarius A star, this is more of a problem. Uh, it's like crossing time is 20 seconds. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the light curve, in, at least in terms of total intensity in the submillimeter, uh, has a time scale of roughly eight hours. Um, and so that, that's more of a challenge in terms of uh, uh, being able to. Uh, Observe on, on these short time scales. I don't actually know what the number would be for, uh, uh, yeah, in, in terms of uh, comparing the intensity that you need to integrate for for Sag star uh, compared to the uh, 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 dynamical time there. Um, but for M eighty seven, we're okay. Okay. So now one question from Lou. Hello. Hi, I can hear you. Yeah, you can. Okay, my question, you mentioned the estimate right now by uh, EHC, uh, the mass is for the stellar estimate, dynamics estimate is better than, uh, larger than the uh, gas uh, estimate. Uh, by hindsight, uh, can we figure out the reason for that? Uh, yes, I've, so I've been told that uh, uh, if uh, if I remember correctly, and this is this is not something that I model. If I remember correctly, uh, the discrepancy can be due to the fact that uh, uh, maybe in the gas there is a significant radial component which is not taken into a to to its velocity, which is not taken into account in the modeling. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm aware that uh, yeah there there are people that are trying to model this better. Um, but I'm afraid I don't know more detail than that. I see. And another question. Uh, right now, we have the modeling uh, pretty sophisticated. Uh, must be many, many parameters involved. Yes. And uh, when, uh, when the, all these parameters together, we determine the mass, the spin, maybe the accretion dates, whatever. Uh, which one would be most sensitive? That means if something not fit qu quite well, can we, we need to uh, readjust something uh, of the disk, of the orientation, of the mass of the black hole, etc.? Uh, so the mass, uh, uh, you don't really need a, G a whole GRMHD simulation for that. Um, um, basically, that just comes from the diameter of the ring, and it's pretty insensitive to your GRMHD prescriptions, uh, except for some really exotic cases. You can see some of them here where uh, you can sometimes be really optically thick or have a, an extended disk, but those are inconsistent with the image anyway. Um, and uh, so, yeah, when it, if, if we end up uh, ruling things out and uh, need to uh, um, explore modeling space more, uh, I think that the most uh, common area where we've had to tweak things is in the electron temperature prescriptions. I, I didn't even talk about this, uh, but... Uh, it is uh, uncertain uh, what the ratio of the ion to electron temperatures is. Uh, uh, the reason is that uh, the mean free path of particles in these systems is so large, uh, the electrons and ions uh, uh, shouldn't thermalize. And uh, we believe that uh, uh, the electrons um, have uh, different uh, temperature ratios in the jet and in the disk as well. And then in addition, we don't think they should even have a, a thermal um, velocity distribution, uh, that they could have a significant uh, non-thermal tail to high energies. Uh, this can have some effect on 
the images, both in terms of total intensity and polarimetry as well. Uh, since this parameter space is so large, um, we haven't fully explored everything yet, uh, but a lot of us are, are working on this, on this problem. Uh, one more question. Uh, right now, in a sense, uh, we are applying general relativity to this system. Uh, basically, if you see some ring, you estimate the mass of the black hole. In a sense, it's not a, a test. Is that correct, my understanding? That means we uh, yeah, so estimate the mass, but we don't know whether that's exactly right. It's maybe more or less, it's okay. Uh, but my question is, it's not a testing, it's an application. Yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, discussion about this that that you can find uh, on the on the archive as well, um, and uh, I, I would personally uh, tend to agree with with your statement that uh, what we what we've seen so far is consistent with with general yeah. relativity. Uh, yes. When when it comes to doing a test, uh, it depends really on the details of what you're testing. <laughs> I would say. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. So I have a last question before we close this uh, game changer seminar from today. And um, so you have a huge amount of data and you have to do 72,000 simulations somehow to fit the data and so on. Are you using also machine learning process, artificial intelligence, how the simulations are done? And the second question is also dealing with uh, such a huge amount of data and you're actually searching for something that you have kind of models, you know, too much than the data, what is still hidden in the data that we, still, that we don't know because we don't know how to look, how to read the data or how to look at the data, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, first of all, um, all of these simulated images are done with brute force. We are not uh, trying to take shortcuts with AI or machine learning. Uh, there, are, there are some people in the field um, which is the safer thing to do. Uh, there are some people in the field who are now trying to uh, generate uh, synthetic images in this way, or, or also use machine learning to uh, classify different images uh, to give it a probability of sane versus mad again, for example. Um, this is still in the relatively early stages, and uh, it's uh, not uh, always clear what signatures the uh, these uh, machine learning algorithms are actually picking up on, as is often the problem. And uh, uh, yeah, so that, that's still in development. Um, and uh, there is, yeah, quite a lot of, of data to uh, continue to, to analyze. Um, I mentioned a few in the talk already. Uh, we have not yet uh, published circular polarization or spectral index maps. Uh, but uh, these are things that are accessible in our data. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, a lot of uh, human time uh, in order to uh, uh, believably extract these products. Okay, so I think we will stop here. Thank you once more. Uh, Angelo was again very nice to have you here. And um, so next week there will be again an online seminar and it will be given by Raffaella Margutti and it will be on the gravitational wave detections and multi-messenger astronomy. So have a nice day. And Angelo, thank you very much once more. My pleasure for being here. You still receive a lot of compliments on the chat, by the way. <laughs> so, bye, thank you. Bye.